All right. So we're in, I believe, week four now um, of our series out of Second Peter. Um, I didn't name it, so it just it's a series out of Second Peter. Um, but the first week, just to recap, give everybody a little bit of context. If you want to rewatch these messages ever, you can go to YouTube and rewatch them. Um, obviously, you don't have to, uh, but if you want to, you can. They're on there, just on the home page under Midweek Experience. Um, mine and then Miss Terry Brooms are also on there. Um, but week one uh, was talking about how grace and peace get multiplied or they grow in our lives within the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so we had the fancy whiteboard out here week one. And like if you drew a big circle and it was the knowledge of God, grace and peace inside of that, grace, God's turning towards you to show you benefit. And then peace, your mind becoming more and more whole. Those things in your life will grow as you get to know genuinely who Jesus is. So that was week one. And then in week two, uh, it was out of Second Peter 1, I believe, 3, uh, where it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. And so week two, we looked at how truly everything you need for your life in Christ is given to you through the knowledge of who Jesus really is and who God the Father really is. And that life in that context is the Greek word zoe, which is like eternal life and then your life here and now in Christ, right? Like you have bios, which is your physical life. You have psyche, which is like your mind, kind of what makes you you. But the zoe is the thing that is eternal life. And so everything you need to quote unquote be successful in Christianity comes through getting to actually know God not know about God through other people, but get to know God. And so that was week two. And then week three, we looked at, this was last week, um, and that was verse four, 2 Peter 1, verse four, through these, or through which, he has given us his precious and magnificent promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, now that you have escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And so the main thing we looked at is how truly transformative the promises of God in our life can be because through them, we get to partake or we get to share truly in the nature of Christ. And then last week we compared like sin nature and then like God's nature and they're like super different. Um, and so we went through all of that last week. So if you want to refresh on all those, they're all up on YouTube, you can do that. Um, but those are the first three weeks. And then tonight, we're going to kind of be uh, mainly in five, but we're going to read all the way from verse three to nine, and then start going through some of that. So I'll start. This is Second Peter 1, verse three, and I'm going to read all the way through verse nine. Uh, I think I'm in like either ESV or Berean Study Bible. I don't remember what the translation is. It's one of those two. Um, so but read whichever one you want. Uh, his divine power has granted or has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. And if you look up excellence in the Greek, it's actually virtue. Uh, we'll come back to that later. And then verse four, through these, he has given us his precious and magnificent promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature now that you have escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And then now we're jumping into new scripture in verse five. For this very reason, for everything you just listed above, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities and continue to grow in them, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever lacks these traits, all the traits he just listed, starting in verse 5, 
Whoever lacks these traits is nearsighted to the point of blindness, having forgotten he has been cleansed from past sins. So that's all the way from verse 3 to verse 9. And so the first thing I want to look at is what these qualities actually do in your life. So we have faith as the foundation, we add virtue to it, then we add knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and then love. And so what Peter says in here is that when you have these qualities at work in your life, they keep you or they guard you from being ineffective or unproductive in knowledge, in learning who Jesus actually is. So we talked about everything we get from knowing who Jesus is in the first couple weeks, right? Grace and peace are multiplied. Everything you actually need for your spiritual life is found in the knowledge of Jesus. And so now he's saying, here's the qualities that should be in your life to keep you from basically not sucking at that. If we're right, I mean, that's basically what he's saying. So if you look at in the Greek, uh, the word unfruitful um, or ineffective, excuse me, ineffective just means like idle, like you just you're not really doing nothing. Um, and then unfruitful basically means um, like it's eternally fruitless. Like it has no eternal value at all. So without these qualities, he's saying in verse 9, if you lack these traits, you're so nearsighted to the point of blindness, having forgotten that he has been cleansed from past sins. And so he's saying all these qualities are what keep you productive and effective in learning who Jesus actually is. But on the flip side, he says, whoever doesn't have these things, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, brotherly kindness, love, everything he listed, these people, whoever lacks these traits, is nearsighted to the point of blindness, having forgotten that he has been cleansed from past sins. And what it looks like Peter is saying here is basically, you almost don't even feel safe. Like you, you've forgotten that you've actually been cleansed from your sin. You feel like an unbeliever. Now, you don't have to raise your hands. You don't need to raise your hands. But I'm sure at one point or another, there are plenty of people in this room who at one point you gave your life to Christ. And then at another point in your life, you feel like, is it even real? Like you almost, you feel as if your past sins haven't even been forgiven. Like you feel unsaved. And this is where only God knows the heart, so I never make a judgment. Like, I believe there are people who have genuinely given their heart to the Lord. And then, like, if you're classic Baptist, you backslidden. That would be, like, the word for classic Baptist, right? Um, but whatever denomination you're from, they would probably have a different term for it. But there's people who've genuinely given their heart to the Lord, and they've just, in some sort of way, drifted, gone cold in some sense. But there's also people who have grown up in religion and said a prayer when they were five and they thought that meant they were saved. And it doesn't necessarily mean that. And I don't say that in any way, shape, or form to shame you or to make you feel bad or to doubt your salvation. But I want you to understand saying something or praying a prayer after a preacher isn't necessarily the thing that saves you. It's putting your faith in Christ that saves you. Right? If you look in Ephesians, um, let me find it right here. Ephesians 2, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance as our way of life. And so it is a genuine faith in Christ, it's a belief in the Son of God that he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, that he was the perfect sacrifice, that he lived a sinless life, that he died for you. It says God the Father was pleased to crush his own son for you and for me and for the person next to you and for everybody down the street that you hate and you wish they'd get hit by a car, 
right? He died for them just like he died for you. And it's you putting your faith in him and believing that it's the righteousness of Christ that saves you. That is salvation. And the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you and you are a different person. So, when you don't have these qualities, you can feel as if you are an unbeliever, even if you're truly saved. And I'm not here to make a judgment, like I said a minute ago, on either way. But figure, go to God and figure out for yourself. I remember, this wasn't even in my notes, but I'll share it anyway. I grew up in a very Christian home. It wasn't religious. It was genuinely Christian. If you know my mom, it's a big-haired lady that teaches in women's, runs women's ministry. As happy and as real as she seems, she's really that happy and she's really that real, right? So I grew up with that. And I said the sinner's prayer probably like 50,000 times when I was four years old. But... It took me going to college and realizing that I had no real desire for God and my life looked no different than the people in my dorm room who weren't believers at all to realize something was wrong. And that that prayer at four years old, I don't know, but I know at 19, I was like, if this God deal is for real, then I got to go all in. And that was when my life really changed. And I don't know what happened when I was four, I genuinely don't. I don't know if I got saved and then I grew cold and then I really gave my heart to the Lord at 19. I'm not sure. But what I know is it took getting genuine and getting real with God. And so if you don't have these qualities, your life may look like a believer or look like an unbeliever, even if you are, or you may not genuinely be a believer. But that's for you and God to work out. And the good news is you're alive and you're breathing, so go home and you and God can work it out. Like if your faith's not really in Christ, it can be today. Um, And so just go home and talk to God about it. And if you go to God, he'll work it out with you. Um, And so these qualities are obviously very, very important to us getting to know who God really is. They keep us productive and fruitful in our knowledge of who he is. And so faith is the foundation, and then virtue builds on that. And we'll we'll go over faith just a little bit, and then we'll go into virtue. That's really the main one I want to cover tonight. Um, But faith is the foundation. We already read out of Ephesians 2. I'll read it again. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Meaning you can't earn your salvation. No amount of good works cancels out your bad works. You can't be mad at your wife one day and then give money to the poor the next day and God calls it even, right? It doesn't work that way. Uh, Scripture says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so it's truly, it's faith and the perfect sacrifice of Christ that saves you. It's faith. And if you see, if you look up faith in Greek, it's pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, and it is always a gift from God and never something that can be produced by people. In short, faith for the believer is God's divine persuasion and therefore distinct from human belief or confidence. Yet, somehow it involves it. The Lord continuously births faith in the yielded believer so they can know what he prefers, i.e. the persuasion of his will. And so there's a yielding to what God births in us that is faith. And so faith is the foundation. If you don't have that, that's where you need to start. If you have faith, if you put your faith in Christ... The next part in the line through verse 5 is virtue. And I was reading this, I studied this some throughout the summer, and it honestly puzzled me as to why Peter would put, like, virtue as the next thing after faith. I was like, of all the things, like, you know, even in here on Sundays, we've been talking about, you know, that eternal life is is to know God, right? John 17, 3. Um, So why would Peter put virtue right after faith. So you have faith in Christ. Now, why is the next thing virtue? And I'll read to you what virtue is in uh, Greek. 
It's Areet. I have no idea if I'm saying that right, to be honest. It's A-R-E-T-E. -E. Areet or Arete. I don't know. Um, but either way, that's how it's spelled. But it means moral goodness, virtue, goodness, a gracious act, virtue, or uprightness. Properly, it is virtue or a moral excellence which is displayed to enrich life. So I'll read that again. Properly, virtue is a moral excellence which is displayed to enrich life. And to be honest, at first, even reading that almost confused me more because I was like, it almost feels like he's saying, now that your faith is in Christ, like, be moral. And I was like, that seems like one of the harder, more legalistic type of routes to go right after you put your faith in the Lord when you still deeply struggle with sin. Like, if there's ever a point in your Christian life where you struggle with sin the most, it'll probably be shortly after you get saved. You'll be on the high for a little while. But then shortly after that, everything kind of comes back a little bit. Maybe not everything, but a lot of it. Um, and so that honestly was puzzling to me. Um, and so I just would kind of go back to it every day, every couple of days, and kind of read through it and start thinking through it. And I think what I've come to is true virtue and surface level moralism are very, very different things. The Pharisees were more surface level moral than any of us will ever be. But they were clearly nothing like Jesus, right? And he says on the inside, they were whitewashed tombs, they're full of greed and all this other stuff. But they had an outward appearance of moral excellence. And so I want to read to you something I wrote actually back when I was first studying this just about true virtue versus moralism. And I believe they're distinctly different. True virtue versus surface level moralism is described as this. Surface level moralism does good acts or moral acts with an impure heart motive. That motive could be selfish, self-serving, or done for the praise of others, right? Like how many times, be honest with me, fellas, you don't have to raise your hand, but you've done something really good just to be noticed. I'm, no, I'm not the only one that's done that, right? Or like you try to be all sweet around the house and do the dishes and all this stuff. We know you're not just doing the dishes for no reason, right? I mean, maybe some of you are, maybe you really are virtuous, but We've probably all done something really nice at some point in time because we wanted something else later. If you're married. <laughs> no, we've never done that, right? So, the motive could be selfish, self-serving, or done for the praise of others. Maybe you've done something that looks good or looks kind or looks benevolent. But deep down, if you're honest with yourself, you did it because you wanted other people to notice what you did rather than doing it for the benefit of the person you did it for. So, or an even deeper moral corruption for the believer would be doing seemingly virtuous acts for the sake of acceptance by God the Father, thus spurning the sacrifice of Christ. And I'll explain that a little bit. If you were here for Dr. Ekman's study that we did through men's and women's last year, um, out of Hebrews 10, there were some uh, Jews that believed in Jesus, but then they were going back and doing animal sacrifices. And uh, the writer of Hebrews is like, that's a big no-no because you're treating the sacrifice of Christ, the blood of Christ as something common. And you think these acts of animal sacrifice needed to be added to this for you to be accepted in God's sight. And he's not a good thing. So, in this day and age, that might be us thinking, yeah, the sacrifice of Jesus was enough, kind of, but there's also this moral code that I have to follow in order to be accepted, and it's my good works. It's me being nice to my kids or giving to the poor or tithing to the church or whatever else. That's what gains me complete acceptance under God. The sacrifice of Christ only, like, partly did it, and I got to make up for it. 
And so maybe we do good acts because we think we have to to be justified. Right? That's probably a lot of religious people in America that think that their good works, their quote unquote good works, are what make them acceptable to God the Father. True, so on the flip side, true and genuine virtue is to do that which is morally excellent from a place of yielding to God's Spirit and allowing His meek and gentle nature to flow through you to do that which is truly a gracious act. Because you remember the definition was its moral excellence which is displayed to enrich life, and it can also be described as a gracious act. So, His meek and gentle nature to flow through you to do that which will be truly a gracious act in which people will be able to experience the very nature of Christ through us and in turn, truly virtuous acts are a vehicle by which a believer can experience more of God's Spirit working both in and through them in this life. And so virtue, I believe, is really a vehicle to be able to experience more of who God is and then have the people around you experience more who God is through you. So a virtuous act is not something you do to gain God's favor. It's something you realize God's Spirit will flow through me to accomplish this task, thereby I can experience more of who He is. And I know that may be a little nuancy, so I'll try to explain it better the best I can. Um, it's as if One act is giving money to the poor because you want to be seen by others. You could do the same exact thing, but if your heart motive is this person has no means by which they can provide for themselves today, and I can truly be an instrument that God can use because I have money today, and I can give it to them, and my hope is that God will flow through me to benefit them in some way beyond just this money. It's the heart motive that would make the act itself virtuous. And you know, whether I give money or don't give money to the poor doesn't change my standing with God the Father because the only thing that changes my standing with Him is my faith in Christ. And so it's done out of a heart that I believe genuinely wants to see people reached for the Lord and genuinely wants to do something that is in tune with God's nature. And the reason I said up here um, in 2 Peter 1, verse 3, at the end of it, it says, you know, that He's given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. If you look up that Greek word, it's arit again. It's called by His own glory and His own virtue. And so to be really virtuous is actually being a reflection of the very nature of who God is. Right, does anybody remember when you were a little kid, patience is a virtue? Right, and you can kind of fake patience for a little while, but then it's like all of a sudden it really runs out. But to really have patience really is a virtue because it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And so the Pharisees had an outward appearance of moral excellence but on the inside, they were morally bankrupt. Jesus was truly virtuous and truly displayed the exact nature of who God the Father really is. And they called him, you know, demon-possessed and a drunkard and everything else. But his was truly, truly virtuous. And so, I think the main thing I've gotten out of this, and I think the main thing that I hope you guys get out of this and what I think the Lord laid on my heart specifically is that to change your perspective on virtue and good works in general. No good work gains you extra favor with God. But every true good work is the opportunity to experience more of who He is. And that's a big difference, right? If I think I have to go give money to the poor so that God will love me, now it's like a begrudging submission. 
I want God to like me, so I need to do this. I have no real care for them. I'm just kind of looking out for numero uno here. But when I realize, no, the heart of God is compassionate. And if I get in line with the heart of God and his compassion, God can flow through me in this moment. I get to experience more of him, which is the best experience in creation. And they, whoever I'm helping, get to also experience who he is. And it's not that God loves you any more when you do that or he loves you any less when you don't, but his, he will flow through what is his nature. What I mean by that is, let's say me and Gaines, who is my four-year-old son, uh, and then I have Axel, which I just think are cool names, Benjamin Gaines and Axel James. So my wife did it, obviously. I, I didn't have anything to do with it. Um, but Gaines is four, uh, Axel's one, Clearly, Gaines basically beats him up all the time because he's one and he doesn't know his own strength. So if Gaines is like, hey, Dad, how about we go punch Axel in the face? I'm probably not going to go with my son to do that, right? Now, I don't love my son any less. I'm still his father. I'm still there to take care of him, to love him, to discipline him, everything. But I'm not going to go with him to do something that my nature is opposed to because I'm not going to punch my one-year-old son in the face, right? Like, if your faith is in Christ, you are a son of God. He loves you. He's already accepted you because of that faith in Christ. But that doesn't mean that he's going to go with you to do whatever you want if it's contrary to his nature. In the same way, I'm not going to go over and punch my one-year-old son because my four-year-old son wants to. Does that make sense at all? Like, God's spirit will flow through you to do the things which are in line with his nature. Going out and having an affair, not in line with the nature of God, doesn't mean you're not saved, doesn't mean you don't have the Holy Spirit, but God's not going to empower you to do that, right? Now, there's obviously other subtle sins, but I want an extreme example so you understand. But if Gange is like, hey, Dad, I got my favorite toy and I want to go over there and give it to my little brother because I love him. Will you carry my other favorite toy so we can both go give it to him? I will go in step with him to do that. We get to experience each other together, and we get to bless little Axe Man, right? So I'm still his father. I still love him. My love for him never changed, but I partnered with him in that act because it was congruent with nature, with my nature of wanting to bless my children. Does that make sense? And so virtue isn't a means by which you gain acceptance with God because you sin less than the person sitting next to you at your table doesn't mean God loves them anymore or loves you any less or anything like that. But virtue is a vehicle by which we have the opportunity to experience truly who God is. And I promise you, nothing satisfies like that. And so realize when you wake up each day, if you ask for that, and you want God's compassion for the people at your workplace, you want his mercy and his gentleness for your wife and your kids who are acting insane, God will start to flow through you to accomplish that which is of his nature, which is patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all of these things. And so his spirit will start to empower you. You get to experience who he is, and then also other people are blessed through that. And so it almost creates this flip to where it's not a have to to gain favor, it's a get to to experience what my heart really needs. And for me, that was a very, very different way of looking at it and very, very different than the way I first read it, which was confusing because it felt like Peter was just telling me to be moral after I got saved. And that's very, 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 very different than this. Virtue is a vehicle not for acceptance, but for God's presence in your life. And virtues will always go with God's nature.